<laughs> Welcome, my dear fiends. Welcome to another episode of Monster Movie Night here at Gargoyle Manor, the Monster Museum. <laughs> I am your host as well as creepy old curator, <laughs> along with my co-host, Boris T. Buzzard. <laughs> and my dear fiends, do we have a wonderful film for you tonight. It's an icon, an icon of TV terrors that may have given you, some of you, your first glimpses of monsters and creatures and things that went bump in the night. <laughs> it's called The Night Stalker. <laughs> That's right, Carl Kochak, his very first film where he learns that, well, vampires and things that go bump in the night are real. <laughs> and of course, you know, he has to find a way to, well, live or die with them, eh, Boris? <laughs> so, my dear fiends, let me turn right around here, and I will feed it into the old haunted internet keyboard. Mm -hmm. The Night Stalker, Carl Kochak. <laughs> now, my dear fiends, let's go right here and we will tune it in. <laughs> well, you you can come all you want, but Carl Kolchak will be waiting for you. <laughs> Now, my dear fiends, let's go to the film through our haunted projector. <laughs> Chapter One. This is the story behind one of the greatest manhunts in history. Maybe you read about it, or rather what they let you read about it, probably is some minor item buried somewhere on a back page. However, what happened in that city between May 16th and May 28th of this year was so incredible that to this day the facts have been suppressed in a massive effort to save certain political careers from disaster and law enforcement officials from embarrassment. This will be the last time I will ever discuss these events with anyone. So when you have finished this bizarre account, judge for yourself its believability. And then try to tell yourself, wherever you may be, it couldn't happen here. Sunday, May 16th. At approximately 2.30 a.m., Cheryl Hughes was standing at the intersection of Casino Center and Fremont Streets waiting for a girlfriend to give her a lift home. Cheryl Hughes was 23, 5 feet, 5 and 1 half inches tall, 118 pounds, blonde hair, light brown eyes, swing shift change girl at the Gold Dust Saloon. Cheryl Hughes, tired and hungry, but just mad enough to walk the eight blocks to her small frame house off the corner of 9th and Bridger. Cheryl Hughes, en route to her doom.
No evidence of dependent lividity either. Peel back the chest flap, please. This should do it. It's incredible. Begin the gross work on internal organs. I'm going to phone the district attorney. And don't talk about this to anyone. I came into it two days later, called back 97 miles from the first vacation I had had in two and a half years because the story is so big no one else can handle it, according to our lovable managing editor. Rumor has it that the day Anthony Albert Vincenzo was born, his father left town. The story may be apocryphal, but I believe it. The only point I wonder about is why his mother didn't leave, too. Good morning, slaves. We are not amused. Kolchak, you are on it. A two-day-old, third-rate murderer. You are on it. From what about them? They have other assignments. You're beautiful when you're angry. Ow. Ow. First stop, county general to see one of my most reliable spies. At least he used to be reliable. Hello, Carl. Oh, I thought you were disbarred from malpractice. I thought we were rid of you for two weeks. Yeah, so did I. Well, about this uh, Cheryl Hughes thing, why does it say officially undetermined under cause of death? Why don't you ask the coroner? Oh, thanks. Come on, you're my spy here. But haven't I kept quiet about all those illegal operations you've been performing in closets? Come on, tell me the truth now, John. Was there anything unusual about the autopsy? No, all I know is she lost a lot of blood. Yeah, some spy. I'm just a poor, hard-working doctor that occasionally takes pity on an aging reporter. Dr. O'Brien, any message there for me? It's a surprise story to me. Second stop. The Gold Dust Saloon and a chat with Gail Foster, one of Cheryl Hughes' fellow workers, and a rather close friend of mine. Poor Cheryl. I feel just terrible about it, Carl. Well, honey, if you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to. No. No, I want to help if I can. Well, you said that she never had any boyfriend. No, none that I ever heard of. She dated once in a while, but never the same man twice. I don't think she liked men. Yeah? Yeah. She even took karate lessons in case one got fresh with her. You mean that she knew karate? Yeah. Brown belt. Oh, I see him. I've got to go. Bye-bye. In any town the size of Las Vegas, the murder of one young woman hardly causes a ripple. But then the ripple started. Thursday, May 20th, 7.02 a.m. I didn't go down. I couldn't. Okay, okay. Don, take your statement. What took you so long, Kolchak? I got a flat tire. Not a footprint in sight. Is that physically possible? If it happened, it's possible. Well, it sure looked like it happened. Oh, come on. Bonnie Reynolds, 27, divorced. Cocktail waitress at the Harem Room Casino. Look at her throat. She must have lost an awful lot of blood. Cheryl Hughes lost a lot of blood, too. You read that in the newspapers, did you? No, I didn't read that in the newspapers. This girl lost a lot of blood, Sheriff. But she didn't lose it here. Anything? We found a purse. There's signs of a struggle up here. But nothing in between. Only our footprints. What'd he do, throw her? Who 
said Barney Reynolds was thrown 22 feet into that car? The coroner? I haven't heard about it. Who said this new killing is connected with the Cheryl Hughes murder? The police? Not to me, they haven't. Who said Cheryl Hughes died of massive blood loss? The coroner again? No, he hasn't even turned in his report yet. And who, may I ask, said that a super powerful madman is running loose in Las Vegas? You hearing voices, Cole Jack? I did not make up the facts. Oh, I know you're born. A big time reporter like you condemned to the sticks with those journalistic rubes. I did not think I know up. you'd like a big fat byline on a big fat story so you can pay your way back to a big fat city job. I but did not! Chat, I expect you to report, not to come up with fairy tales. Nicole Jack, quit parking the PD. If something turns up, they'll let us know. Meanwhile, use your head and lay off. Whatever they're up to, they don't want any help from amateur bloodhounds like you. Friday, May 21st, 8.06 a.m. Apartment of Carol Hanacek, swing shift cocktail waitress in the Bird of Paradise show lounge. She'd gotten home around 2.15 a.m., poured herself a glass of milk, opened the back door of the kitchen for reasons unknown, and died like the others. Suddenly, quietly, without disturbing her sleeping roommate only a few feet away. Something of a pattern had started to form, and it was ugly. It was then that people stopped talking. Does that surprise you? Look, Carl, you're not the only one that likes to play detective. The police, the sheriff boys, they all think they're pretty good. And they don't need you. You know, you really make me feel wanted. We've had three murders in town, Bernie. We have one tremendously strong guy, maybe more, who goes around killing young girls. And they all lost a lot of blood. Hey, you weren't supposed to know about that. No, I'm not supposed to know about that. That I know. What about your people down at the Bureau? No, this is nothing for the Bureau to mess with at this stage. Yeah, well, you could make some unofficial inquiries for me. Like? Well, like, you could check around the country and check all the hospitals and see if any of them have had uh, corpses recently, like ours, you know, all with a big loss of blood. You could check all the uh, insane asylums across the country, the bug houses. See if they released recently a nut who thinks he's Count Dracula, even if he's done nothing to prove it. Do you believe in vampires, little boy? Oh, that's funny. That's very funny. It's very funny, pretty. Ha <laughs> ha. What are you going to do? Are you going to sit like a cheap gun of guzzling my beer? I'll think about it, okay? <laughs> Meanwhile, I hope it doesn't disillusion you to know that the local law enforcement people go along with your views. Huh? Somewhat. At this moment, they're waiting for a special report from the coroner and two pathology experts who were flown up from LAP. Oh, yeah? Along with a small truck out of the foot. Yeah. Oh, hi, Marilyn. How are you? Hey, I like your luncheon place. Yeah. Well, say, if you want to hear the special report, meet me at the sheriff's office. It starts at 6.30. Hey, Tang! Don't thank me. Just be there. Where are you going? Oh. Call Jack. Hi, Carl. I just thought you'd like to know I heard the Parkway Hospital was knocked over. Yeah, knocked over for what? Cash, drugs, equipment, what? Blood. That's right. Every container in the place. Their entire stock. What about blood type? Seems blood type and RH factor didn't much matter. John. Can't stop now. See you. Yeah, but... p.m. Clark County Courthouse. Present, in addition to myself and two incompetents who called themselves reporters, were Warren Butcher of the Sheriff's Office, Thomas Payne of the District Attorney's Office, Captain Edward Masterson of the Las Vegas Police Department, and old buddy Bernie Jenks, holding forth with his inimitable cool, Dr. Robert McCurgy, boy coroner. We found that death in each case was extremely swift, coming in something less than a minute. After the initial wounds were inflicted, 
The blood was drained very quickly, some kind of suction device being used. And this would explain why no blood was found anywhere in the victims or in the areas they were discovered. Uh, Doctor, Cold Shark Daily News, do you have any idea what could have made these wounds? They're not unlike the bite of a medium-sized dog. What do you mean, oh, dog? What? Dog, dog, what are you telling us, a dog did these murders? I didn't mean to indicate that the wounds were actually inflicted by a dog, only that they're similar to those which might be caused by a dog. A rather interesting point is that we found another substance mixed in with the traces of blood in the throat wounds, namely saliva. What do you mean, saliva? I mean saliva, Sheriff Butcher. Human saliva. If McCurgy had suggested that the murders were committed by a giant butterfly, he couldn't have made more sparks. Now, what do you mean, human? Are you suggesting that each of these women was bitten in the throat by a man? At present, the evidence points that way. However, I couldn't and wouldn't hazard a guess as to motivation. I can only be sure they each died from shock, induced by massive loss of blood. Uh, Dr. McCurgy, is it possible that he killed these women by biting them in the throat for the express purpose of drinking their blood? Kolchak, now you're here by the mutual suffrage of us all. It's sufferance. <laughs> what? It's sufferance, Sheriff. Well, whatever it is, just shut up. I'll answer that. There have been cases of people who, through some mental derangement, have come to believe they were vampires. In Germany in the 1920s, there was one fellow who did use his teeth to rip out his victims' Now, throats. we are not going to jump to any conclusions about who or what killed these women. It is possible, you know, to type a person's blood from his saliva. If I were you gentlemen, I'd look for a very anemic fellow, possibly with some rare blood disease. Well, I don't care what kind of a nut killed these women. But I'll tell you this, he's out there, and I bet he's high on pot or the hard stuff, and he's going to kill again unless he's stopped. Masterson, what have your people got on this uh, Parkway blood theft? Well, the latest is the nurse said she saw something funny out there last night, or early this morning. Seems that a tall, skinny guy dressed as an orderly was nosing around the refrigerated storage area. That's where they keep the blood in the plasma. She didn't think much of it then, but later when she spoke about the guy to the, to the floor super, she was told that there was no such tall, skinny guy on duty there. Description as follows. White male adult, six feet two to six feet four, thin, about 175 pounds with pale complexion, dark hair. So we start looking for a man, local resident, or worse yet, some outsider who may not even still be in the area. We check the airport, the bus terminal, railroad station, blockade the highways, and if we're lucky, we'll get him. If he's stupid enough to still be hanging around after three crimes. Now, you got any other suggestions? You just do it. All right, let's break this up. Thank you, Dr. Ma... Ma... Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Payne. I shouldn't be too inclined to reject Mr. Kolchak's theory out of hand if I were you. It is at best highly speculative, but not altogether unwarranted. Kolchak. You can throw away that cassette. Now, this uh, vampire stuff is to stay right in this room. Until we have the assailant in custody, we say nothing about these uh, women being drained of blood. There'll be no rumors, no reports in the paper. The official opinion at this time is that the cause of death is undetermined. So we don't want to cause a panic. <laughs> it's bad for police operations. It's bad for the people. And it's bad for business. <laughs> Thank you for your cooperation. Uh, Kolchak, uh, I want to have a talk with you. Now, boys, there's no reason to bother the doctor anymore. I have a prepared statement in my office. You can go back to the lab. Kolchak, you're becoming a real pest. I'll have to have a word or two with Vincenzo about you. You know, maybe one of the other boys at the office should handle this from here on. Keep your nose clean, son. Stay out of other people's business. <laughs> it's healthier that way. 
Carl. Will you watch what you're saying? You know these guys. You could find yourself out of a job in 86 all over town. Did I go for you too, Jenks? Oh, boy, who can talk to you when you get like this? Now, listen, I'll nose around unofficially for you on anything you bring me, just between the two of us. But do me a favor and stay away from me for a few days, just for friendship's sake. Did I say it was a vampire? Well, what did your suggested headline say? The story makes it clear. Vampire killer in Las Vegas, question mark. Do I misread? The story makes it clear. Do I misread or did you use the word vampire? Some screwball who imagines he's a vampire is loose in Las Vegas and people ought to be told. If there's a screwball running around loose in Las Vegas, his last name begins with a K. You already heard about the little scene you have with the boys downtown. No vampire stories. Clear? How about a special featurette with a border of roses? Uh, an interview with the two girl victims in heaven uh, with a celestial choir in the background. Ow! Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I guess I fell asleep. Yeah. Uh, what were you saying? You know, you do great things for my masculine ego, you know? Yeah. Well, actually, I was saying that I, I think that Vincenzo has a new sense of a tree stump. It's got to be one man. It's got to be big, strong, psychotic. Well, you're certainly making me very glad that I work nights. Mm. Oh, well, I told you to quit working nights, didn't I? I am forever in your debt, love. What was that? The killer's done it again. Oh, no. Only this time, he was seen. Showgirl, 25, 5 feet, 8 inches tall, 125 luscious pounds, less the weight of 12 pints of blood, of course. Well, looks like Bella Lugosi's struck again. Knock it off. It's her daughter. Oops. I'm all right now. Now, the car he drove away in, was it new? No. It was... A few years old, I think. It was Maroon Coop. I'll call it in. Uh, Barney, may I? Uh... Yeah, but uh, take it easy. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Cole Shack, The Daily News. That was your daughter? My best contact in Las Vegas has always been Helen O'Brien, chief switchboard operator at the county courthouse. Hello, adorable. You're a sadist. Mm -hmm. Well, I could take it back. Ah, over my dead, plump body. Listen, you magnificent morsel. The DMV is checking on the suspect's car. Now, you couldn't help me in that area, could you? Of course not. Bribed again. Full check. Yo, no, Bertie. Come on. How'd you like to see the killer's face? Thank you. 
Sherman Duffy of the Chicago Globe once described a reporter as follows. Socially, he fits in somewhere between a hooker and a bartender. Spiritually, he stands beside Galileo because he knows the world is round. Not that it does much good, of course, when his editor knows it's flat. Oh, Jack. Shelley Forbes has got to be his fifth victim. Look at the way her dog was killed. You'll never give up, do you? What do you mean? I mean, this is unacceptable. Unacceptable? Oh, Jack, I'm very close to firing you. Even though the owner of this paper has a soft spot in his head for has-been big city reporters. I am tired of your pressure, Goldjack. I'm tired of the owner's pressure. I'm tired of the pressure from all around me to blow the story up on the one hand and keep it under wraps on the other. I am tired of being the middleman, Goldjack. Do you understand that? Can you understand that? What do you want, Vincenzo? A testimonial from Count Dracula? Out! Get out! What is this out-out gal? Get out game we play! This nut thinks he is a vampire. He has killed four, maybe five women. He has drained every drop of blood from every one of them. Now, that is news, Vincenzo. News! And we are a news paper. We are supposed to print news, not suppress it. You know darn well why we're soft peddling this thing. No! Tell me why. Could it be because we have been told to? Call Shack, you are an idiot. Worse, you're irresponsible. All these murders mean to you is a bylaw. Well, what the hell difference does it matter what it means to me? The point is that we are suppressing news. We are withholding information. Everybody in town knows what's going on. The police, the DA, the coroner's office. The, the, every reporter on every newspaper in Las Vegas knows what's going on. The only people who don't know are the people. At last you got the point, Goldjack. The people in Las Vegas don't know. Because the people in Las Vegas would come unglued if they did know. Even more than they're coming unglued already. Capish? Tuesday, May 25th, 7.30 p.m. Helen O'Brien had told me that the DMV had come up with 16 possibles. All but one had been eliminated. The car owner's name, Martin Lubin. Address on Spring Mountain Road. Name and address, both phony. Name of salesman who sold car, Fred Hurley. So I sets him a price. He don't say nothing, he just stands there looking at me. <laughs> All right, now, how'd you find out about this, Kolchak? Well, a fine little bird told me about it. Don't now you just my account. Keep your mouth shut. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, like I said, he just stands there looking at me. Then he tells me the price is too high. $300 too high. And he keeps staring at me as if daring me to tell him the price is $1,200. Is this fellow? Now, stop doing our job for us, Kolchak. That's already been established. Yes, yeah, well, you see, uh, I told him only he had a mustache. Mustache? Yeah. Yeah. Did you sell him the car? Well... I started to say no, but something inside tells me, ah, don't mess with this guy. I mean, he's a creep. With them red eyes and that voice, he's enough to keep a guy from working nights. You know, my dear fiends, tonight's uh, feature, The Night Stalker, starring Darren McGavin. Now, you also may recall that he played in a, uh, a Christmas story. That's right. It was called A Christmas Story. And he played the dad, sometimes grumpy, had a little fetish for leg art lamps. <laughs> but I believe that uh, Darren will always be remembered as his uh, character of Carl Kolchak, the news reporter. <laughs> and in fact, you know, my dear fiends, some of you may have learned what you learned about monsters and things of the supernatural from this particular little show when it went to TV. <laughs> Indeed. But you know, just think about if it was now and good old Carl had not just a tape recorder and a little flimsy camera that had one shot in it and would take blurry pictures, but if he had his phone uh, that could take pictures, videos, recordings, the works, he wouldn't have to carry all that other stuff around. And of course, if he had uh, a field guide like we do, to, uh, it's called A Field Guide to Monsters. <laughs> and it has about every monster that you can think of, from vampires to Frankenstein monsters to golems to mummies to ghosts. Uh, anything and everything is in this little booklet. And it's, you know, pocket size so that you can take it out into the field and uh, find out what you're dealing with. Because poor old Carl, he had to wing it. 
you know. He had to figure it out all by himself. Trial and error. And of course, if he had an error, that could have been the end of him. Mm, hey, Boris. <laughs> so we hope you're enjoying tonight's feature. So let's get right back to it, shall we? <laughs> all my life, I've waited for a story like this. All my life. And when it finally comes, I can't get it printed. Do you know the holes in Mary Brandon's neck were airbrushed out before they printed the photographs? Yeah. Carl, if you keep going on like this, you're going to get fired again. <clears throat> Let's see, how many times has it been? Uh, twice in Washington, mm. three times in New York, twice in Chicago, and once, or was it twice in Boston? Huh. I'm becoming extinct in my own lifetime. Homo nuzacus, natural habitat, a pool of sour mash bourbon. You know, I really ought to light a candle to Ben Hecht. Here. You ought to quit your job, you know. And you'll support me? Well, I... Oh, come on, honey, I'm serious. That weirdo said five girls, and they were all night workers. Five? Yeah, five. Oh. Yeah, a girl named Shelley Forbes is missing, and I'll bet my bottom dollar she's victim number five. Hey, you know, you are insured pretty good there. Carl, I've been doing some thinking. Oh, what do you know about vampires? Well, only they wear dinner suits and talk with marbles in their mouth. Oh, will you please be serious? Watch my natural habitat, then. Open it. Oh. Everything you always want to know about vampires, we're afraid to ask. No, you're going to look at oh, it. Come on, why? Well, what if the killer's a real vampire? Oh, honey, please. I've well, had a very long He's done everything week. that's in this book. Whoopee, whoopee. You're going to read it. Yes, all right. I'm going to read it. Huh? Ooh. Ah. Oh, now, come on. You're a big, tough reporter. <laughs> you can take it. You might even get a good feature article out of it. That's it. Oh, yeah. Since the beginning of man's existence, there have been creatures of the night, crazed monsters that track the bloody prince through the pages of fact and fiction. Of them all, the vampire seems to have accumulated the largest body of documentation. By night, the vampire is virtually indestructible, fearing only the sign of the cross. Before daybreak, he must return to his coffin, otherwise he will be destroyed by the purifying rays of the sun. It is then, while he lies dormant, he can be destroyed by hammering a wooden stake through his heart. According to the legend, the victim of the vampire will ultimately rise again as the living dead and must be destroyed in a similar manner. From any source available, the vampire must have blood. duty as night editor when the PD squat box went crazy about a wild brawl at the old town hospital.
Thursday, May 27th, 8.20 a.m., and things were rolling. Our morning edition hit the streets, recapping all the action at the hospital. The TV people, as usual, had missed out completely, and the radio stations were literally reading our copy on the air. But now the whole lid was really blown off. The maniac had been identified. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. I just got these out of the suit. Yeah. Now, here's a rundown on the Scotland Yard and the Interpol findings. Subject, Jano Skorzny. Born in Krajewski, Romania, 1899. Now, now, wait just a minute. You trying to tell me this guy's over 70 years old? Come on, Bernie, your boys have come up with the wrong man. Like hell we have. These facts have been triple-checked and confirmed. Now, look, I've been up all night, and I'm pretty tired. Now, do you want it or don't you? All right, Bernie, just take it easy. Let's hear it. All right. Skorzny's father died in 1923. He left somewhere between 75 and 100 million dollars. At this time, he began to travel, and he became known throughout Eastern Europe as a big lover of nightlife. Now, we don't have a lot more on him before World War II. However, Scotland Yard reports that he showed up in England just in time for the German Blitz. I'm sure Mr. Kolchek will find the following facts of interest. Such formality from a man who always guzzles my beer. While in England, he passed himself off as Dr. Paul Belasco, specialist in hematology research. His work involved freshly killed air raid victims from various London emergency rooms. As a matter of fact, at his residence in Shaftville Court, he installed several kinds of sumps, tubs, and an extremely large commercial meat freezer. In 1948, he turned up in Canada still as Dr. Belasco, and further checking uh, made his presence known in almost every place along the U.S.-Canadian border where rioting and violence and a number of dead bodies were found. We believe he left Canada for Vegas April 19th under the name of Detective Constable Alan Hensley. Now, because of his British citizenship, he is an international fugitive. So my people are very interested in this. This is no longer just a local matter. Now, gentlemen, the one constant that has shown up in all of our reports is that Skorzny's travels have always been accompanied by a number of unexplained killings, many of which have one thing in common, a massive loss of blood. So, if Skorzny is not the vampire of Mr. Kolchak's theories, he is certainly the suspect of multiple homicides extending back some 30 years. Uh, Mr. Jenks, you seem to be running this show. Uh, could I have meant to say something? Mr. Kolchak, you have the... Kolchak, now you keep it short. I was at the hospital yesterday, and a lot of things were happening that you just simply cannot explain away. Sheriff, your own men shot at him, some at point-blank range. How come it didn't even slow him down? How come a man over 70 years old can outrun a police car? How come the same man when slugged in the head doesn't even bleed? Now, I saw those gashes in his head, and whatever it was was trickling down from those wounds, it was clear. It oh, was yeah, this not guy's blood. got a motor mouth. Can't we shut him up? No, let him hang himself. Then we'll finally be rid of him. So far, he has killed four, probably five women. Now, the coroner said that those bite marks on the throat were made by human teeth. He practically confirmed the fact that he actually drank their blood. Now, no, 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 wait, now, whatever the scores he may be, he seemed to be functioning as if he were a vampire. Now, you can go on operating as if he were an ordinary man. Uh, that's up to you. But I know that the only way you're going to get him is if you proceed under the assumption that he's a real live vampire. Oh, now, wait, wait, now, wait, now, wait, now wait, the research that I've been able to find... Wait a minute, Kolchak, have you lost your mind? Can you imagine the total blind panic this town would be in if the public were told we were actually looking for a vampire? Not to mention the irreparable damage it would do to the image of law enforcement in Vegas. Ah, that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's it! Boy, I really can't believe that you guys are so afraid of appearing stupid that you'll ignore the only possible way of nailing him. You listen, Kolchak, and you listen good. We'll handle this by ourselves and without undue public observation. No undue public observation. You've blown it already. Look, look here. Look what's appeared in my paper today. People are going to be calling for a grand jury investigation. You can't stop the rumors. Go over. Sit down.
I don't care what's been printed in the newspapers. This man is still classified as an ordinary maniac, and he'll be settled by standard police procedures. Oh, boy. And you better start cooperating with that fact, Kolchak, or you want to get your pushy-tushy kicked right out of town. You dig? Yes, sir, I dig. But just remember, the next time you blow it, who's got the answers, sir? All right, Ed. Let's get on with it. What have you got? Well, the two departments combined have 650 men on full-time duty. All leaves are canceled, and everyone's working a 16-hour day. Our chopper is going from dusk to dawn. We've got unmarked cars patrolling the casino center and the strip. All roads are blocked, and we're receiving complete cooperation from the highway patrol and the jeep posse. You got it? Got it. Repeat. What did I say? Show every real estate agent in town a picture of this guy's puss and ask him if they sold a house to anybody that looks like him. Good boy, you got it. Now, right. going. now wait a minute, wait a minute. When will I lose this last dollar? Mickey, has the idea of winning ever occurred to you? You know, I have a very strange, unhappy feeling that the police are never going to catch his murderer. I also have another very unhappy feeling. Which is? That this case may be even bigger than I thought it was. Bigger? Well, stranger than. I've seen a lot of weird things in my life, love. I have never, ever seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. You don't tell me that you're finally going to believe. Shh. I don't even want to think about it. Car 14, check out the report of the two ladies downtown Casino Drive. Code 1033, code 1033, all units, all units. Janos Skorzeny, spotted in 1969. Green unpaneled station wagon, intersection OK and Hustles. ID confirmed. <laughs>
Friday, May 28, 3.17 a.m., despite the helicopters, the highway patrol, the jeep passing, despite the blocking of every major road and highway, despite the mass coverage of Las Vegas by every available man in both police and sheriff departments, Giano Scorzini was still at large. <laughs> The courthouse conference room had been a scene of chaos for more than three hours now. Messages were still flooding in from every outside unit. Every available man who had taken place in the capture attempt was being debriefed. At the hospital, two officers had died and a third was hovering on the edge. Reports on them were still coming in as the greatest manhunt in the history of Las Vegas continued in vain. Thanks, Bernie. Yeah. Well, what are we going to do? Now, are you willing to listen to my insane idea? Kolchek, get out of here. Now, Warren, hold it, hold it. Kolchek, you were there, weren't you? Yeah. Every man we've questioned insists not only that scores and he was possessed of incredible strength, but that he was shot more than once during the capture attempt. Oh, I'd say 30, 40 times. I'm sorry, I'm not buying that. Captain, you have two choices. Either he was shot, or your entire police department is blind. Ed, let's admit it. We had the man, had him cornered, and we couldn't hold him. Let Kolchak have his say. Oh, uh, before I do, is it agreed that in return for my help, you will grant me the exclusive rights to the entire story? Uh, well, let's say it's agreeable if we decide to follow your suggestions regarding the suspect. Fine, fine, because if you don't follow my suggestions, you're going to be chasing your suspect till doomsday. Cool check. Just get on with it. Of course. Each man in the field is to be issued one of these uh, to be carried uh, in his pocket. This gentleman. Where'd you get that? Well, I have a friend who's got a furniture repair store. I woke him up and had him make it. Each man in the field is to be issued one of these and uh, one of these. <laughs> Are you suggesting that we pound one of these into Scorzini's chest? No, no, into his heart. There's a legal phrase for that, Kolchak. You might have run into it once or twice in your broad experience. It's called premeditated murder. It's the only way you're going to stop him. You heard your own men. Can they all be wrong? Oh, well, you, uh, you can stop uh, your nighttime chases from now on, too, gentlemen. Uh, the only hope you have is to spot Skorzeny and then track him back to where he lives and wait until sunrise before finishing him off. Uh, he's only vulnerable during the day. At night, he's much too strong. Yes, gentlemen, I hate to say this, <laughs> but it looks as if we have a real live vampire on our hands. Ed. Yes, sir. Warren. Yeah. Tom, I'd like to be in on this, too. Okay, Kolchak, you've got yourself a deal. Conditional. What's that? Put you here, we'll issue the crosses, the mallets, the stakes. The one thing he won't do is depart from established police procedures. If feasible, Scorzini is to be taken alive and held for trial. Trial? That's right, trial. <laughs> trial. All right, in return for what? You'll get the exclusive rights of the story. Good. Uh, when the blackout is lifted. Uh, yeah. Any other conditions? Uh, one more. What's that? 
If it turns out you're wrong, you're to be out of town in 12 hours. Take it or leave it. All right, I'll take it. Uh, because I know I'm right. And uh, you know I'm right. Right. Ciao! I'll take Manhattan, the Bronx and Staten Island, too. Watch out, you great big, wonderful, big apple coal shacks coming back. Yeah! As Manhattan's coming here, wait till I get to a man. Get out there, man. Get out. It's me, Crawford! What are you doing driving off with me in the back seat? What are you doing in my back seat? I wanted to talk to you. I saw your car parked here, so I got in to wait for you, and I got sleepy. You got sleepy. Hey! I think I found the house. I told Crawford to give me 30 minutes before telling Jenks where I was. That way I could get to see the house alone for a while and also keep the police from arriving before dawn, which I knew they'd do if they got the chance, no matter what I told them.
Jimmy Forbes. Shh, shh, shh. Relax, <laughs> His own private blood bank. Wow.
Just in time for the special kitchen. Hey, why don't you stop working nights? Oh, Carl, not that again. And marry me. What? Well, you're a good cooker and a good kisser. Why not? <laughs> oh, baby, you're gonna love New York City. Honey, after this story hits the news services with my byline. Oh, all us the... married? Yes, us <laughs> married! <laughs> Don't look now, baby. <laughs> but Cold Shack's coming back in style. <laughs> there you are, Vincenzo. And if I do say so myself, it's sensational. I'm sure it is, Carl. You're going to put in the special edition, right? Yeah, with pictures. Uh -huh. yeah, and the new services. Okay, fine. What's going on you, Vincenzo? Are you sick or something? I think this is all fine, Carl. Fine. Uh, Jenks has been trying to reach you. Yeah, what do you want? He wants to see you over at the DA's office. Why don't you run over there now? Yeah. Uh, phone, Jack. You're one hell of a reporter. Thank you, sir. And a bright good morning to all of you. Bernie, what did you, uh... Is your name Carl Kolchak, and do you reside in the city of Las Vegas? Well, you know my name's Carl Kolchak. Well, what's going on? Well, Carl Kolchak, you're under arrest on the charge of murder. The state requires that you be informed that you have the right to remain silent. Have you seen... <laughs> no. Oh, no. No chance. You're not going to pull that one on me. <laughs> Kolchak! You are under arrest. All right, Payne, just what kind of a dirty deal is this? You have a very short memory, Cold Jack. A few hours ago, Sheriff Butcher himself saw you actually pound a wooden stake through a man's heart with this mallet. A man wanted for questioning. Questioning, mind you. He hadn't been arrested. He hadn't even been charged. You broke up our stakeout. And after we were kind enough to invite you to go along, you just charged in there in front of us and killed Janos Gorzeny before we had a chance to do anything. Well, you were even ranting and raving about this Gorzeny being some kind of a vampire. And you had to save the world. And that, Mr. Kolchak, is murder one. Now, if you plead insanity, you might get lucky, but I promise you this. You'll be committed to an asylum for the rest of your life.
I pull your fat out of the fire and you do this. Carl, will you just sit down a minute and listen to them? Bernie, you were there! Carl, just listen. Uh, this is your story, Kolchak. It's already being printed. This morning, shortly before sunrise, Las Vegas Sheriff deputies under the command of Sheriff Warren A. Butcher, 45, surrounded the home of Jano Skorzeny, a fugitive from a federal warrant, and in a pitch gun battle, were forced to kill him. Never. You'll never get away with it. What's to stop me? You're gonna stop yourself, Kolchak. Because if you open your mouth, we'll find you, bring you back, use this warrant, and put you away forever. Pick him up, Kolchak. Pick him up and get out of town. Now, we'll take care of your back rent. I want to call Gail. She's not there, Carl. What have you done with her? Nothing. We just asked the young lady if she'd be good enough to leave town. She's an undesirable element, Kolchak, and we don't want undesirable elements in Las Vegas. Carl, there's nothing I can do. Carl, you, you let me know where you end up, huh? Yeah, sure, Bernie. I'll keep in touch. So all the loose ends have been gathered together and tied into a pretty knot right around the neck of guess who. After I left town, I began putting notices in the personal columns of newspapers from San Francisco to St. Louis. Until I ran out of money, that is. So far, I've received no answers, but I, I'll keep trying even though I don't think I'll ever find Gail Foster again. Maybe it's just as well. So that's it. The book's finished. And now you'll have to judge for yourself. I must warn you, however, if you try to verify this account, you will find it quite impossible. Item, in Washington, D.C., there was no longer a file listing the suspect under his true name or any of his alleged aliases. Item, in Las Vegas, all of those who were involved have either left town, aren't talking, or are dead. I haven't had a decent night's sleep since all this happened. And now you might find it difficult, too. Because there is still one fact that cannot be buried. After the death of Janos Skorzeny, he and all of his victims were immediately cremated. Why? Remember the legend? All those who die from the bite of the vampire will return as a vampire, unless destroyed first. So think about it and try to tell yourself, wherever you may be, in the quiet of your home, in the safety of your bed, try to tell yourself it couldn't happen here.
Wow, Boris, that ending was something, wasn't it? I mean, they didn't believe Carl. He had, you know, he had, well, he didn't really have pictures. They were kind of blurry. And, uh, uh, of course, you can't really take a picture of a vampire really well, no. But, uh, you know, he lost his girlfriend and who was, he was thinking about becoming his wife. And he, they ran him out of the city. Well, you saw it all. You were there. I'm just recapping in my head. I can't believe it. I mean, this great man should have, uh, he should have took his story to the Enquirer. They would have printed it and probably believed him, you know. <laughs> well, my dear fiends, we hope that you've enjoyed tonight's feature film. And it was a Dan Curtis production. You know, Dan Curtis from Dark Shadows. And he, he also made Dracula and Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with, uh, with Jack Palance. Oh, my evilness. This man knew his monsters. <laughs> and we love him for it, don't we, Boris? Indeed we do. Well, my dear fiends, it's that time again for my coffin, for your bed, <laughs> and Boris' is perch. Until then, until next time, as always, <laughs> keep screaming. <laughs>